It is good to come together and sing and, uh, and remind ourselves as we sing praises to God that he is the Lord our God. Because sometimes we forget that. If you were with us last week, you know we talked about this uh, project uh, to sponsor Compassion Children, that we have a long-standing relationship with the country of Ecuador. Uh, sent missionaries there, have done work projects there, and we prayerfully decided we were going to try to help Compassion International uh, clean up the slate of all the unsponsored kids in Ecuador. We talked about that, and we, you saw the video called Make Room for One More. And sometimes you look out at the needs of the world, a refugee crisis, child poverty, and you think, what difference can I make? One of the great things about Compassion's work is they make it possible for you to make a difference in the life of, of a child. In fact, I don't want you to take my word for it. We want you to hear from a, a, a grown-up Compassion child. Her name is, name is Cecilia Numwanda, if I got that right. And she's going to come and tell you her story about how com Compassion sponsorship changed the whole trajectory of her life. So will you please welcome with me Cecilia. Wow. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. What an honor and a joy to be here um, this morning. I'm so grateful to God for the opportunity to stand here and share with you what he has done in my life. How he used Compassion International to change the story of my life. I grew up in Kenya, uh, in a village in western Kenya. And I come from a large family of initially 10 children. My parents didn't have a source of income. What they did was subsistence farming. So that means they grew things on the farm. So if anything grew on our farm, then we had food. If nothing grew on the farm, then there was no food. My parents never went to school. So they did not see the need to put any of us in school or even to insist on any of us staying in school. And to add on to that, uh, both my parents were alcoholics. Um, so many days they would go drinking, they would disappear from home. We would not know where they were. And when they came back home, it was all fighting and violence back home. And being in that environment was really, really hard. I thank God because he changes the stories of our lives. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Growing up in that home, I did not have hope. I did not think I would have a future. I did not think I would be anything because there was nothing around me at that time. One day, uh, my uncle came home and told my mother that he was going to help her and how was he going to do that? He told her, I'm going to take one of your children. I'm going to go with this child in Nairobi. And I'm going to put this child in school. And I hope that one day this child will come back and change this family. So you can guess which child he picked, right? I'm grateful because he took me to Nairobi. He put me in school. But he could not keep me in school because he had to pay for me to go to school. So I was in and out of school most of the time. I would have to go home and look for money. There's no money. I go to school. I think maybe they've forgotten. No, go back home and look for money. There's no money. That was me. I really wanted to stay in school. So one day, the Compassion Social Workers came to our school looking for needy children. Compassion works and partners with churches, the local churches in every country that they work in. And in these uh, churches, they have set up compassion projects and they have social workers who know the community, who can go out to the community and look for these needy children. So when they came to my school, my grade three teacher forwarded my name to the compassion social workers. I got enrolled into the compassion program and that is when my life began to change. I got wonderful sponsors, Bob and Colleen Staggs from Ames, Iowa. Bob and Colleen Staggs sponsorship ensured that not only did I go to school, but I was able to stay in school, that I could go to the Compassion Project and learn the Word of God. I gave my life to Christ because someone at the project shared with me the love of Jesus. And I learned that I could pray that God would change our family, that my parents could stop drinking, that our family would be different. I'm grateful because of the sponsorship of Bob and Colleen Staggs. 
through their letters, they encouraged me. They wrote to me, telling me how much they loved me, how much they were praying for me. And they believed in me even when I did not believe in myself. I'm grateful because I'm standing here today because Bob and Colleen Staggs once decided that they were going to sponsor Cecilia. I'm grateful because through their sponsorship, I stayed in school. I completed my elementary education, my high school, and went to the University of Nairobi to do a bachelor degree in physics. And from there, I got a scholarship to go to Italy for two years to pursue a postgraduate diploma in physics. And then I came to Memphis, Tennessee in 2011 to pursue a PhD in geophysics, which by the grace of God, I completed in December of 2015. I continue to work at the University of Memphis, and right now I'm also a sponsor with Compassion because my family, my daughter and my husband, she's five, and we are also sponsors with Compassion now because I know what it means to be that child on a face, a packet, waiting for someone to pick you up and speak life to you and tell you that we are here, we are praying for you, and we love you. I've also started a... Um, mentorship program in Kenya for Kenyan women in physics just to encourage them that they can be anything they want to be because we've been there and God has been faithful. As I stand here today, I'm just a testimony that indeed God can change the story of any one child on those packets today because he did it for me, not just for me, but for my family, that my parents stopped drinking. They started going to church, something I never thought was possible. Last year, um, September, my father passed away, but I'm grateful to God because he knew Jesus. He did not just pass away as a drunkard, but the story of my family changed. So as I stand here today, I'm grateful for compassion, for them helping me, not just me, but when you sponsor a child, you change that child's life. You change a family, you change a community, you change a nation. So thank you so much for the opportunity to stand here and tell you what God has done. And I always say that indeed I am released from poverty in Jesus' name. God bless you so much. I heard her tell her story yesterday. It's, uh, I mean, yeah. From uh, not sure that she had a hope to a PhD in geophysics. And that's just, that's just the material part, right? A life changed, a family changed. We want to give you a chance to, to be that. Uh, I love when she talks about this couple from, from Ames, Iowa. Karen Colleen, right? Starks from Ames, Iowa. And God knew what he was doing when they sponsored, when they sponsored Cecilia. You could be that for some child in Ecuador. In the next two songs, if you, I want you to pray about this. And if, if it, God moves in your heart, you can go right now out the back to the table uh, if you'd like to. If you don't want to get out of your row, in front of you is a QR code on every chair. You scan that, it'll take you to the website that has lists of faces and names. Like Cecilia said, she knows what it's like to be a face on a card, hoping somebody would, would care enough to sponsor you. Maybe that's you for somebody to write to them, to pray for them, to sponsor them at $38 a month, and let God use that to change a life. Jesus took the, the loaves and fishes, right, and multiplied them to feed them at thousands. He can take your sponsorship and multiply it in one child's life. Let's stand together, and as we worship, if God moves in your heart, you can sponsor a child right now. It is good to sing of the goodness of God. It's even better to have Ricky sing of the goodness of God and us to sing along with her. We're grateful for the gifts of our worship team and, and how they lead us each week. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, all our lives you have been faithful to us, even when we are unfaithful and forgetful of you. And your goodness is indeed running after us and we run from it sometimes. So now in this moment, help us to turn and face you, your word. And hear the good word you would speak to us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, it, Nabil Qureshi uh, uh, passed away of cancer a, number of, a couple of years ago. And bef 
he's famous for a number of things, an apology, Christian apologist. He wrote a book called Seeking uh, Allah, Finding Jesus. Grew up as a, a devout Muslim and had interactions in the States with Christians and he was seeking to try to challenge the, 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 these Christians and prove them wrong. And in that quest, God got a hold of his heart and he became a believer in Jesus. He says in his book, if you've read it, and I highly recommend it if you haven't, he says in his book, he says, one of the hangups for him was he could not figure out as a devout Muslim how the death of some Jewish guy 2,000 years ago could possibly save someone today. That made no sense to him. He says, I didn't understand how his death, this guy that no, I've never met, lived 2,000 years before me, how is that my hope and salvation? How does the death of Jesus 2,000 years ago save anyone? How would you answer that question? It's a good question. It's the essential question we're going to examine this morning. I know it's Palm Sunday, and normally we talk about the triumphal entry, Jesus coming into Jerusalem to the shouts of the crowds and waving palm branches, but we're going to talk about death instead. <laughs> the death of Jesus, and what is the significance of his death? Really, what was the purpose of the death of Jesus? Did he die as an example of, of self, self-giving love? Some would say that's it. Did he die as an innocent man just at the hands of wicked men? Well, he's certainly not the first to have that happen. Was it all a tragic mistake, a conspiracy? If we say as Christians he died for our sin, how does that work? How is it just for someone else to die for what you deserve? That seems unjust, actually, doesn't it? What really do we mean when we talk about, I'm saved by the death of Jesus? Clearly, throughout the Gospels, Jesus saw this as his mission. He understood that his death was the whole point. I mean, his life and his miracles and his teachings were all very important about the kingdom. But he said, I've come for a purpose to give my life as a ransom for many. He said over and over to his disciples, the Son of Man must die. So he understood it. It was like his mission. But what does it mean for us today? But we're going to look at a couple of passages, and we're going to walk through a few of them really quickly to kind of bring us up to speed as we near the end of the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And by the way, if you're a note taker or interested in this sort of thing, this is the central question that Pilate cares about. It's the question on which this whole uh, story of his death turns, at least in the first century. And he answered him, well, you said so. I love Jesus for many reasons. Right? So, uh, and the chief priest accused him of many things, and Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer. So the pilot was amazed. So the, the text says as soon as it was morning. What that means is during the night, there's these series of trials. There's a trial of when they drag Jesus out of the Garden of Gethsemane before the high priest's stepson, uh, or son-in-law, excuse me. Uh, and then they bring him before the high priest. Then they bring him before the whole Sanhedrin. Then they bring him before Pilate. But this is all happening at night. And there's a, there's a list of 22 rules about Jew, in Jewish law from the Mishnah in time of Jesus about how a trial was to be conducted. This trial of Jesus overnight breaks every one of them. Rule number one, to be no arrest by religious authorities that was affected by a bribe. Rule number two, no steps of criminal proceedings were to occur after sunset. Rule number three, judges or members of the Sanhedrin were not allowed to participate in the arrest. Rule four, there to be no trials before the morning sacrifice. And on it goes. The whole thing's a setup, in other words. They're rushing this thing through. Why at night? So the crowds that were supporting Jesus wouldn't even know. He's on the cross by 9 a.m. We'll, we'll see that as we go. By the time most people are getting up, headed to work, he's half dead. They didn't want this to be known or seen. And Jesus won't give an answer here. Now, we're going to look at four reasons or purposes for the death of Jesus as we go. In the first few verses, the Jewish Sanhedrin had to convince Pilate, the Roman procurator, that this was worth his time. Because under Roman law, the Jews could condemn someone to death, but they could not carry out the sentence. Only Rome could do that. So for Jesus, for them to actually have Jesus crucified, they're going to have to convince 
the Roman official, the governor, Pilate, that this matters to him. And he doesn't care at all about Jewish law, about blasphemy. He doesn't care about any of that. It's not worth his time. He cares about one thing, the question, are you the king of the Jews? Because there was one king, one lord, that was Caesar, and everyone else was underneath him. Pilate wants to know, is this a troublemaker that's going to cause me a problem or not? That's what he's after. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, well, you said that. Where'd you get that, in other words? Jesus' kingdom actually is a threat to Rome, but not the way Pilate assumes, not from military or political overthrow. Jesus' kingdom advances today. Rome is long gone. The kingdom of God, Jesus says in John, is not of this world, but it is a threat to all political and earthly kingdoms. There is a subversive movement in it. Isaiah 40 tells us nations rise and fall, but the kingdom of God, the word of God, stands forever. And Daniel chapter 7 says that his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, that all generations and all nations will bow down before him one day. So Pilate's looking for a way out. I don't want to deal with this guy. This is some religious nonsense. I'm looking for a way out. But there's a crowd who doesn't want the, a riot to break out at the time of Passover because the city is swelling way beyond its normal capacity at this time. He's just trying to keep political peace. He tries to release Jesus. You might know this story. They have, there's a time in the, in the Passover to release one condemned criminal. So he says, I'll release this man to you. And then the chief priests get the sh crowd to shout, no, release to us Barabbas, a condemned murderer. The whole thing backfires on Pilate. Let's look at verses 12 through 16. And Pilate again said to them, then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, and by the way, that's never a good way, that's never a good policy for governance or rule or leadership, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him over to be crucified. So he's basically backed into a corner and the easiest way out to not cause is just to put this guy to death. He's a nobody. He doesn't really want to. He doesn't think he's guilty. He thinks it's probably nothing, but he's weighing the situation here. I got, I got a mob on my hands, and it's much easier to take care of one guy than this crowd, which is what he does. I almost feel a little bit sorry for Pilate. Not, not a lot, just a little. He's just trying to avoid trouble. But all this is happening according to God's plan. Now, if we go to verses 21 to 32, we get to the detail of what happens. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene. So Jesus has been condemned to death on the cross. He has to be led out of the city because they could not crucify him inside the city walls. Outside the city walls, in a hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull is where they crucified criminals, condemned men. Condemned to carry the cross beam through the city out to that hill. Jesus has been scourged, he's been up all night, he's struggling to get through the city streets. So they compel this man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus. This is interesting, Mark is a man of few words and few, uh, an economy of phrases, but he gives us three names here, and I wanna talk about why real quickly. Simon of Cyrene, Cyrene is in Northeast Libya today, North Africa, so he's in town for the Passover like a pilgrimage, the trip of a lifetime, to be in the holy city at the time of Passover for a faithful Jew from North Africa it would be like the trip of a lifetime. I remember years ago, my wife and I got to go to Israel and the Holy Lands. It was a trip of a lifetime for me. Think of the cost it would take in the first century to get there. And he's apparently with his sons, Alexander and Rufus. And the Roman soldiers make the guy carry the cross. Like, talk about a bad turn in your vacation, right? Ah, but my boys, you know, because they could compel him to do it. Why does Mark include these names? What purpose do they serve? Romans 16, 13, Rufus's name is mentioned. I think for one reason. These three names are known to the early church. These three men are known to the first Christians. He's citing his source material. This is, this is historical evidence for the reliability of the New Testament accounts of the death of Jesus. These are, you could go ask these guys. They were known in the church. Is what Mark says is true? They were there. Here's the first reason or purpose for the death of Jesus. 
The death of the king fulfills God's plan. The death of the king fulfills God's plan. So much of what we read and will read in Mark's account is pointing uh, to various Old Testament prophecies. Uh, we're going to read a couple of them from Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. And keep in mind, Psalm 22 was written a, a thousand years before the time of Jesus. David wrote the psalm about a thousand years before the time of Jesus. And Isaiah 53, written by the prophet Isaiah, 700 years, give or take, before the time of Jesus. Psalm 22, verses 16 through 18. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet and count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. These are both direct references to what's happening at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. And by the way, this is written a thousand years uh, before the time of Jesus. And crucifixion had not been invented yet. The Persians invented it, the Phoenicians uh, developed it, the Romans perfected it in about the 6th century B.C. There was no crucifixion when David wrote this. And it didn't happen to David. Who's he talking about? How specific this prophecy is of what's happening to Jesus. In verse 27 of Mark 15, Mark, along with several other gospel writers, tell us that Jesus was crucified between two criminals. Isaiah 53, 12 puts it this way. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Numbered with the transgressors. He was counted among the condemned. He was put in the group of the sinners condemned to die, those who deserved it. You'll remember the thief on the cross on either side of him. One mocks him. One said, this man's done nothing wrong. We get, we're getting what we deserve, but not him. But he's still counted among them. That means he's taking our place, numbered where we belong. The death of Jesus, this is the second thing, saves us from our sin. The death of Jesus saves us from our sin. It would be unjust for God to compel an innocent person who had nothing to do with it to die in the place of somebody who was guilty. But Jesus is not just an innocent bystander. He's not just somebody who had nothing to do with it. He is the king and the judge of all the earth. He's the only one who rightly can take our place and, and it be just. Because he's, as Paul says, both just and justifier. The one who judges and the one who makes us right. Look at verses 30 through 32 again of chapter 15. So they're, they're mocking him. And this also is a, is a part of prophecy, that the, the, the people would mock him. They're teasing him. And listen to what they say. Save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross. That we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. So you've got the crowds mocking, the chief priests mocking, and what's interesting is they're using, essentially saying the same thing, aren't they? What are they saying? Save yourself, meaning come down if you're the king of the Jews. Come off that cross if, you, if, you're, if you're almighty God. If you're all powerful, then this should be no big deal for you. Come down, save yourself. In other words, we'll believe that you're the Christ if you come off that cross. But Jesus is proving he is the Christ by staying on the cross, which none of them understand. The crowds are mocking. The beautiful irony is that he's proving who he is by remaining there, even though he could have come off. I, I remember, I've told this story before, but when we were in Israel, and at the, the home of Caiaphas, the high priest, there's a chamber uh, in the lower uh, levels, cut out of stone, the lower levels of his home, where they suppose the high priest would interrogate those who had broken some Jewish law through a, st a hole, a, a shaft cut into that stone to the condemned person down below. We had a chance to go down into that chamber. While we're waiting in line, our chance to go down there, about five or six men from Texas who were on the same tour were down in that rock chamber with their belt buckles and boots and the whole bit. And they started singing together a hymn. Imagine five burly Texas men down in this stone chamber 
singing the song, the hymn, he could have called 10,000 angels. And their voices were coming up through that stone shaft. Now, I started imagining Jesus down there being interrogated by Caiaphas. A couple of lines from that song, in case you're not familiar. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. Those Texas voices coming up through that. I was weeping, listening to them sing, thinking about Jesus. And of course, the crowds are mocking, saying, prove, prove to us you're the Christ. And Jesus is hanging there, essentially saying, I am proving to you that I'm the Christ. This is what the Christ came to do. Which made no sense. Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23. The cross is foolishness to the Gentiles and a stumbling block to Jews. It doesn't make sense. How could the king of kings and the Lord of the earth hang naked dying on a Roman cross? What sense does that make? But of course, that's our God. Doesn't do things the way we would do them. His goal is to try to make perfect sense to your human mind. He has an eternal perfect plan for our salvation. I, I was looking at a, a, a recent post by a pastor I follow and I'm friends with him, Glenn Packiam out of Colorado Springs. And he writes this, the palm branches were a symbol of revolution in that day for Palm Sunday. The cult that Jesus rode in on was a symbol of royalty and victory, conquest, triumph. But neither the palm branches nor the cult become the symbols of the, of the church. The symbol of triumph and victory and royalty becomes the cross. Think about that. We don't put palm branches on the doors. You don't, we don't wear a cult, a little gold cult around our neck. The cross. Our God can take the darkest, most despicable thing and redeem it. And we see it now as a symbol of hope and grace. But until you see yourself as in desperate need of a savior, the cross isn't that beautiful to you. It doesn't make sense. Let's look at verses 33 to 37. And when the sixth hour had come, by the way, for those of you that aren't familiar, the Jews counted uh, the hours from six in the morning was the first hour. So Jesus is on the cross, the third hour, which is 9 a.m. By the sixth hour, that's noon, of course, for those of you that are not so good at math, right? There was a darkness over the whole land. So at noon, midday, a darkness comes over the whole land until the ninth hour. That's for three hours, it's pitch black in the middle of the day. With historical, uh, the historians have done the research. This is not a time where a solar eclipse would have happened. Some have speculated, well, maybe it was a dust storm. There's no records of that either. We're left to understand that this is a supernatural event to symbolize God's judgment over sin. Anybody know the ninth plague? Remember the plagues? In Egypt, I was, last night I was watching, uh, before I went to bed, uh, a, a replay of, of, of the Ten Commandments from 1956. Charlton Heston had such cool hair and a beard, right? <laughs> he was not very Jewish looking though. But anyway, <laughs> uh, the ninth plague is what? Anybody remember? Darkness. Judgment over sin. Darkness is a symbol for, uh, 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 for sin and for lostness. For evil, for wickedness. This is the next third point. The death of, G of the king overcomes our darkness. The death of the king overcomes our darkness. I've skipped over Amos 8, 9. It's a, it's a prophecy there. On that day, declares the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. In Exodus chapter 20, 10, verse 21, the ninth plague of darkness, we're told it was a darkness that could be felt. What is that like? You ever been in the darkness so thick you can't see your hand, you can feel it? There's an ominous presence? I think that's what's going on in this moment as Jesus hangs on the cross in the middle of the day and it's pitch black. Three hours of darkness. What's the worst day in human history? What's the darkest hour? Well, you could probably guess what I'm gonna say based on this sermon content. Some might say 9-11, pretty dark day. December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. Go back, we could, 1933 was the day when Hitler rose to power. 
There's been some dark days, but none like this. And what's happening here? This day was dark enough for the Son of God to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting directly Psalm 22, verse one. And it's easy to read that and think, well, he's, he's crying out in anguish and desperation. There certainly is physical pain, and there's anguish, and there's desperation. But it's not a defeated cry. What he's saying, in effect, is, I know why you have forsaken me. I'm fulfilling prophecy. He's quoting the psalm written a thousand years earlier. And remember, in the garden, in the darkness of the garden, when he prayed and sweat drops like blood, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. That's where the wrestling match to go through with the cross really happened. That's where the Son of God determined, I'm I'm not going to back away from this. Yet not my will, but your will be done. So on the cross, when he cries out, why have you forsaken me? It's not this sad, pitiful, defeated person. It's the king understanding what he's accomplishing. Jesus was betrayed in the dark. He's arrested in the dark. He has this trumped up trial in the dark. And now he's dying in the dark. What that's telling us is that there's no darkness in your life. There's no darkness in this world that he cannot overcome. There's no shame or pain or despair that seems too dark for you, but not to God. We're told in John chapter one, verse 15, that, or verse five, excuse me, that the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. And then in verse, let's look at verses 37 to 41 once more. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathe his last. Let's talk about that cry for a minute. What, what did it sound like? What was the cry of Jesus? It's, I think it's depicted often in Hollywood or in, uh, in, in our popular imagination as this sort of like a loud, desperate cry. But actually, John tells us specifically what he said. That in John 19, verse 30, His cry is, it is finished. It is finished. This is the loud cry of Jesus on the cross. It's not a cry of defeat. I want you to hear this. It's a cry of victory. When Jesus hung on the cross and he cried out, it is finished. He's declaring something. He's in pain, he's in anguish, no question but he's declaring victory as he dies. That's the beautiful picture of the gospel. Do you see it? What's happening there? This brings us to the fourth point. The death of the king gives us access to God. After Jesus cries out, it is finished, the next verse shows us what specifically was accomplished. What it was that was accomplished. He's tearing the temple curtain from top to bottom. If we look at verses 37 to 39 one more time. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Do you know the temple curtain separating the outer courts from the Holy of Holies? There are actually two curtains, the holy place and then the most holy place. That, that curtain on the inner courts that, that separated the Holy of Holies from all other people, only the high priest could go in there, where the Ark of the Covenant was, symbolizing the presence of God, was 60 feet long, 30 feet high, and estimated three and a half to four inches thick. And it rips from top to bottom. What did that sound like? It must have been deafening, terrifying to hear that sound that massive piece of fabric being ripped from top to bottom. And what did that mean exactly? What's happening there? Ephesians 2 tells us that God broke down the dividing wall of hostility. He he broke down that which separates us from God. He himself is our peace, Paul says in Ephesians 2, destroying the dividing wall of hostility. Romans chapter eight says, Paul says, I'm convinced that nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God. When Jesus cries out, it is finished in a loud voice, and that curtain is just ripped from top to bottom. That's the the vivid picture of God throwing open the access to the Father, to the death of the Son. And then there's this part about the centurion. 
And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. This is no minor detail. This is no throwaway little addendum here in the story. This is crucial to understand. The Roman centurion, whose whole job was to preside over the death of Jesus. Like this is what he did. He was a centurion over crucifixion detail. The soldiers carried out his orders. His only job was to make sure those guys died in an orderly fashion. He'd watched countless men hang on crosses and die. He'd heard them whimper and beg for mercy, plead, cry out for their mommies, scream curses, shout in anguish. He'd seen it all. But something about this man dying was different. He'd not heard anybody shout in victory in the midst of darkness in the middle of the day. Do you know Mark chapter one, verse one, the very first, we started this whole journey way back in September, Mark 1, 1, Mark says, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Do you know this is the, this is the only other time that Jesus claims to be son of God and people don't like it, but he, the centurion is the only one who acknowledges him as the son of God. Peter calls him the Christ, his profession of faith, but the centurion, a pagan, Gentile, Roman soldier who's supposed to make sure he dies is the one who sees him for who he truly is when he's on the cross. It's shocking. That loud cry that Jesus utters is a cry of victory. He'd never heard or seen someone die this way. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 23 puts it like this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have a confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way, that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with his true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. If you caught those lines in there, since we have confidence, full assurance of faith, let us draw near to him. Let us hold fast to our hope. Do you have confidence that you can enter into the presence of God? When you pray, do you have confidence? Or do you, are you, seriously, when you pray to God, are you kind of like, oh, it's been a while, Lord. It's me again. Remember me? Sorry. Do, do, you, do you feel sort of sheepish and meek and like you shouldn't, you have no business talking to him? We have confidence because of Jesus to enter into his presence, the most holy place, that place which you could not go because of your sin, you're separated from him. By Jesus' death has been torn down. You've been given access if you're in Christ. We have access. The centurion, who's more of an outsider to the people of God than a pagan Roman Gentile soldier? who's actually presiding over the death of the king, sees him for who he is. That means that every man, woman, every child, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, from, from Nairobi, Kenya, to Geneva, Illinois, in the US, the Ukraine, Russia, Moscow, China, Shanghai, right? There's no place, no person, no tribe, no tongue, no color of skin, no socioeconomic barrier. All the things that we prop up as human beings to divide us are torn down in Jesus. All are given access. That's the beauty of the gospel. The gospel is an invitation that is as wide as the world, but as narrow as the cross. There's no distinction. You're all invited, but there's one door. He himself is our peace, Paul says. All are given access to the Father. So let us come before him with confidence into his presence. Full assurance of faith. Don't you want full assurance? There's not a lot of assurance in the world today. I can't give you any assurance about what's gonna happen with the economy. I can give you no assurance about the midterm elections. I can give you no assurance about what's gonna happen in the educational system or with your job or what's happening in Eastern Europe. I have no assurance to give you. I have only one assurance to give you, and it's the cross, and it's the surest thing in the universe. This is the reason for the death of the king. Everything hangs on this, as he hung on the cross. Those who were crying out, prove, come down, prove to us who you are, and Jesus is saying, I am proving it to you, right now, dying in your place. Do you want that assurance and that access? It's available to every one of us, 
And here's the thing. I know for many of us, you can come to church your whole life and not know it. Put your Sunday clothes on. It's Palm Sunday. Come back for Easter. Go to brunch. Sing the songs. Do the stuff. And never know. Never know the access you've been given to the Father through the Son. I'm going to pray right now and I invite you to pray with me. Father, some of us in this room, we know the access that you've given us through Jesus and we, we just don't use it. We don't access your grace and your power and your love the way that we should. We don't live like we have that assurance of faith. Forgive us for that. Help us to walk in faith, in confidence and in assurance because of what you have done, not because who we are, because of what you've done at the cross. And I know there are some in this room who know about you, but they do not know you. They have never entered into that life that you offer them. They haven't faced that they deserve the death that you died in their place. And God, you are not trying to condemn them, but to set them free. And if that's you, I invite you to pray with me. Father, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I acknowledge that I belonged on that cross. And I give you all the praise and glory for dying in my place, and I receive your death as payment for my sin. And I want the life that you offer and invite me into. For all of us, God, we say thank you for giving us access. We praise you, Jesus, our crucified and risen King. In your name, amen. Let's stand to our feet. Before the benediction and you're dismissed, I want to remind you, perhaps you've been mulling over Cecilia's story and thinking about how you'll respond. There are members, she'll be back there with Matt Kitchen, who's from Compassion International. You can ask any question you want. We have volunteers ready for you. Don't let this morning pass by if God's moving in your heart to sponsor a child, make a difference for all eternity in their life. Now, brothers and sisters, go in the grace, the strength, the power, and the access of your king, your crucified and risen king, Jesus Amen. And go in peace.